the day. Oh my gosh, we're almost we're almost there. <laughs> Strong. Um, so we're really looking forward to celebrate uh, everything of today, the conference this past year uh, with you tonight at the banquet, which is going to be at the Treasury Ballroom. Um, if you have any confusion about where to find this, just grab me, grab a volunteer, we can walk you through it. Uh, but it's going to be at 326 Southwest Broadway, which is in your handbook. And when you get to the main door on Broadway, it's going to be the door to your left. But we'll have people directing you too, but just in case. But we hope you will all join us there. Thank you. Uh, and just to add to that, if anybody could use transportation help, if walking to the venue is difficult, would you let Coriana or I know, and we'll we'll figure out how to facilitate that um, from wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so since we only have four mics, I'm going to start the panel here. So we are here to celebrate the second year of the Bly Grant recipients. Um, and as a special treat, the folks from Spiderweb Show down there on the end um, have brought a bunch of technology and backstage, uh, offstage right in the green room, uh, after the panel kind of pre-AGM, they invite everybody back to come experience what it is they're going to try to explain during the panel. Um, and I caught some of it as they were setting it up and it's really super cool so I encourage you to go back and see what they're doing. Um, so I'm going to just kind of introduce everybody by name quickly um, and then we're going to jump into letting them talk about their projects and we'll you know hopefully do some crosstalk and some crosstalk with you. So to my immediate left, no introduction needed, is Mr. Mark Bly. Next to him is Sarah, Sarah, Sally Olive. Next to her is Kelly Kerwin. Next to her is Sarah El Keshef. Next to her is Allison Bowie, Joel, Adria, and Michael Wil Wheeler from Spiderweb Show. And, and because of the complicated technical nature of their project, we're actually going to start with them, and then they're going to slip out to go prep for you guys to come. So I'm going to turn it over to the three of you. Tell us what the heck it is we funded. OK, hi. Uh, First of all, just thanks for having us here, and, and thank you for this grant. It's been really instrumental in getting this started and, and, and very valuable, so thank you very much. Um, I'm actually going to talk mostly just about what Spiderweb Show is and how we got to the Digital Creation Studio, which my colleagues will talk more about. Uh, Spiderweb Show started in 2013, and it started as a, a website that was asking the question, what is Canadian theatre? Uh, and it was brought about because uh, we had a new artistic director of the National Arts Centre in Canada uh, context that's kind of like uh, our Lincoln Centre if it was in a town of 500,000 people. Uh, and, and Jill uh, brought on Sarah Stanley as her associate artistic director there. And Sarah uh, was in charge of something called the, the Collaborations, which uh, was funding small pieces of Canadian theatre across the country. And one of the things that uh, both Jill and Sarah were interested in was how could uh, the internet connect theater creators. And so uh, they came to my theater company, Praxis Theater, and they said, how could we use the internet to, ask, to answer the question, what is Canadian theater? Not definitively answer it, of course, but you know, look into answering that question. Uh, uh, so uh, the website just started with Sarah and myself. Uh, we kind of had a blog, and we commissioned some video projects, and there were some podcasts. And it really took off, and we found that it was actually uh, too much work for uh, just two of us to do it. And also, we couldn't really answer the question, what is Canadian theater? Because Sarah was based out of Ottawa, and I was based out of Toronto, and, and Canada's a big country. So uh, we found collaborators by adding uh, New World Theater in Vancouver, uh, Alberta Theater Projects in Calgary, uh, and Allison joined us uh, from Montreal. And so then we kind of had nodes in the four biggest uh, cities in the country. And the project started to evolve. And I guess uh, probably uh, the five kind of core things that, that Spiderweb Show uh, started to do over the course of the last three years are one is um, a bi weekly magazine called CDN Cult. And uh, that's pri my primary job as the editor of that magazine. And the way the magazine works is we commissioned three Canadian theater artists uh, to write on a given theme uh, every two weeks. Uh, so uh, that has proved to be um, super helpful as a framing device as opposed to just having a blog where just things are coming out as people send it to us, but actually having um, a focus to it so we can say, what do we think about this controversy that's going on in this particular city? And we can be very specific to an issue or we can have a national issue and, and commission three artists from across the country to get different perspectives on an issue. And so that's the magazine. Uh, 
we have podcasts. Everybody knows what podcasts are. We've had a couple of different contributors to podcasts from across the country. Um, we also have a thing called the Performance Wiki, which Allison will speak about more, but basically a wiki that's attached to a map, uh, which is a searchable database of, of Canadian performance. And uh, I'm missing one thing. What am I missing? Thought residencies. Ah, thought residencies. Uh, this is, I have to give Sarah total credit for this. It's a really interesting idea where basically we all have um, iPhones or whatever kind of smartphones with us, and uh, you can use those uh, to just record a thought whenever you have one. And so we commission a different artist each month to just record their thoughts on their phones, and then they're uploaded to SoundCloud, and then you can go to our website and hear all the thoughts that a given theater artist has had uh, over the course of a month. Um, yeah, and some of them, you know, some of them are interesting, some of them aren't, but I actually think, you know, dramaturgically, it is a really interesting question because like 10 or 20 years from now, people will be able to go back and search a given artist and think and find out what all of their thoughts were in a month. And I think as a historical um, digital document, it's an interesting project. And then the last thing that I'm quite proud of that Spiderweb Show has done so far is actually the, the curation of a hashtag. Uh, so we use CDN Cult, just like everybody here uh, uses LMDA 16. CDN Cult kind of as a national hashtag to which to send interesting cultural conversations about what's going on in Canadian theater. And uh, you know, for about the first year, year and a half, Sarah and I were the only people using that hashtag. And, it was kind of an inside joke amongst us, but I'm really proud of how much it's taken off, and, and people across the country now, when they're tweeting about Canadian theater, they will end it with CDN Cult, and you can really kind of check out that hashtag and, and uh, get a sense of what's going on in, in Canadian theater through that hashtag. Uh, so that brings me to the Digital Creation Studio, which we're here to talk about today, and that came from, um, Sarah was directing a show in Canada called um, Helen Lawrence, really massive show, um, ended up going to BAM, and it was very high uh, video design, and part of the video design required actors to um, perform w without seeing their partner, just perform with the camera, and the video design would transform what the audience would see. And at the same time, we were having weekly Google Hangouts uh, for Spiderweb show, and she kind of put the two ideas together to understand that, oh my goodness, maybe people could actually use all the technology that exists now to rehearse in, in different locations at the same time. And so uh, that's when uh, we were at LMDA last year, basically, and so uh, we saw the Mark Bly uh, panel last year, and we thought, let's pitch that as an idea. Um, so that's what Spider Show Web Show is, and that's how we got here, and now I'll turn it over to Joel, he's our technologist, and he can explain the nitty gritty. Hello there. I'm not gonna get too technical uh, on, on all these details, but uh, so, that was actually, uh, speaking of Helen Lawrence, that was kind of how I got involved uh, with the project and how I sort of met Sarah. Uh, I was uh, acting as the, the video technologist on that show and sort of endured all the very interesting complexities of that show with her. And, um, and so uh, she sort of invited me to uh, contribute on, on uh, this, this project. Um, and so, as Michael mentioned, we're sort of creating a digital creation studio that we're calling CDN Studio. Uh, and the goal of it is to sort of create a virtual space online to rehearse um, and really allow different people uh, in different geographical locations to rehearse virtually. Um, and the best way to describe it would be sort of an advanced Skype call or video conference. Um, but instead of seeing sort of an image of each person's face, uh, you're really getting to see a composite Im image of everybody who's participating in, in their room. And I'm actually just going to show a couple pictures of our test setup uh, that we were working on this afternoon. Um, here's sort of a, an example com composite image. We have uh, a few people uh, composited together. So we have Michael in one of the rooms. And uh, we had a very gracious volunteer participating. So you can see they're all in three different rooms, but they can see each other in uh, in the same virtual studio. Um, and so uh, this is not terribly new technology. Uh, you know, we're using basically green screen technology to achieve what we're doing here. Uh, just like a weatherman who might stand in front of a virtual map uh, for TV, uh, CDN Studio composites other members of your team members into that background instead of uh, you know, a map of the Western United States or something. Um, and so where we're at today is uh, that this is our sort of first time together. Um, Michael and Allison and I uh, are from three different cities, and we've never actually met in physical space before. 
Um, but we've been coordinating and, and experimenting with different software. Um, and so this is our first time together. It's the first time actually testing it out. We're using a prototyping software called Touch Designer that's allowing us to do this. Um, and it's really sort of an alpha test. Um, it is, uh, we're not quite on the internet yet, but we are uh, routing it through a network, and so we're sort of testing the possibilities and the limitations of that. And our goal is to eventually scale this um, to, to use open standards. Uh, there's, there's something called uh, WebRTC, uh, which is basically allowing us to do a Skype-like experience uh, just within a web browser without the need for plugins or Flash or anything like that. Uh, so you'll actually be able to, once we've uh, continued to develop it, you'll be able to access CDN Studio from any web browser. Um, and so our next phase will be to sort of develop this out into, uh, develop the web software involved. And uh, once it's all complete, you'll, you'll be able to join a studio uh, using a high-speed internet connection, uh, an inexpensive green screen kit, um, a webcam, and a, and a set of headphones. Um, so we've set up three stations in the dressing rooms backstage, and after the panel, we'd really like you to come join us and test it out, see what it feels like. Uh, we really want your feedback to sort of see what does it feel like to rehearse in virtual space. Um, it's not a huge area to explore. Uh, that you, you're somewhat limited to this amount of space that you can walk in. Um, but we want to get your opinions and sort of what your thoughts are uh, and just sort of first impressions. Um, this is an early prototype, so uh, you know, don't expect the hollow deck quite yet. Um, but our goal is to continue improving it to make it as, as immersive as possible. Um, there's some really great uh, technology coming down the pipe that involves uh, virtual reality and Microsoft HoloLens, and we certainly see that as uh, you know down the road a possibility to to really encourage the possibilities. Um, so I'm going to let Allison talk a little bit about the sort of dramaturgical ramifications now of of what this technology might allow us to do. So uh, just to give context of how I joined um, Spiderweb Show in the first place, I was an MFA dramaturgy graduate from the University of Massachusetts. So I'm coming back to the States to, uh, for the first time actually as a dramaturg uh, in the professional world, which is kind of nice. Uh, I moved back to Montreal and went, what am I gonna do now? And I started harassing Sarah Stanley uh, until she met with me in Ottawa. Uh, and I started translating and then um, came on as a grant writer, actually writing Canada Council grant and the, the Mark Bly grant. I, I, I worked with the team uh, on a lot of those grants. Um, and now I'm uh, one of the associate dramaturgs on the team. So I'm, uh, I'm really interested in this project because a lot of my work looks at digital dramaturgies and how, uh, as a production dramaturg, I can continue the conversation with audience members outside of the performance space, um, but also how digital technology within a performance can affect the story or the narrative that's being told, and what can we do differently with that. Um, so that's sort of where my interest lies in this project. Um, like Joel was saying, this is the first time that we've physically been in the same space, but we've spent a lot of time backstage not being in the same space to make this happen, um, which is kind of ironic. Um, one of the big questions that Spiderweb Show is asking is what is the Canadian dramaturgy that exists? And right now, it's very localized because it's such a big geographical country. Um, we have dramaturgy that exists in Vancouver that's very specific to there, or Calgary, or small towns. So while we have a series of dramaturgies that exist, they're very either culturally oriented or geographically located. So what CDN Studio is able to do is allow us to look at what happens to the dramaturgy in Canada and what happens to the Canadian theatre identity if we take those boundaries away, if we make theatre accessible and theatre creation accessible across the country. How can that change what we understand Canadian theatre to be? If an artist who is in Nunavut can collaborate with an artist who is in Toronto, what stories can they tell? What narratives can emerge out of that experience? And one of the things that Michael mentioned is performance wiki. Uh, I was on the team that developed the map that actually goes along with this. And this allows us to uh, track the entries that are put into the performance wiki. We have different categories. So we have um, a nonprofit uh, community, um, 
for-profit theaters, events and festivals, university, and then we also have categories that are specific to First Nations um, creations, so that's uh, the Aboriginal peoples in, in Canada. And we can track and look and see where stories are being created, where theater is actually being created in those different categories across the country. So what St CDN Studio will allow us to do is see how that map changes. Where are those stories gonna be created? Or how are we gonna be able to visually track when a story is being created in a multiple of locations all at the same time? So those are some of the big dramaturgical questions that we're, we are embarking on when we're so excited to be part of this. So thank you so much again for the opportunity for us to get started on this. We really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, we're gonna be there until five o'clock. So please, please come and jo join us and, and explore um, this with us. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to jump to Kelly, okay. uh, in part because David Copeland and I were hanging out this morning, um, and one of the things that we were talking about was that I have a slight obsession with following like big pop culture trends. So whatever you know, trashy book you're supposed to be too embarrassed to read, I love to read because I'm like, why is everybody reading Twilight? Which is what we were talking about. Why is everybody reading Fifty Shades of Grey? Um, you know, when the Harry Potter books came out. I loved being able to chat with a seven-year-old on the subway because we were both carrying around a Harry Potter book. And it was reminding me of the conversation you and I had about, you know, in, in a more intellectual realm, um, about you saying, you know, your interest was kind of having your finger on the pulse of what was going on in the field about the changing shapes of what theater was, and clearly everything about your project is exploring that. Um, so do you want to tell us a little bit about POP and kind of how that stemmed out of that interest? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much, and thank you for Mark and Beth and the LMDA selection committee. It's just been awesome to have the opportunity to pull the trigger on this like wacky idea <laughs> like I have. Um, so POP is a um, pop-up performance festival that's going to be taking place in Bushwick, Brooklyn in um, September 23rd through the 25th. And what is a pop-up performance festival? Well, that's a great question myself. And so <laughs> it's, um, it's like really stemmed from this idea of just like I was in grad school, you know, just like, you know, indulging my senses and like all this like great stuff and also learning all this like classical shit. And um, <laughs> a lot of my peers and I were also making a bunch of weird stuff that wasn't really fitting in a box or in a black box theater or, you know, so a lot of people I, I, I was seeing not just coming from Yale School of Drama but from elsewhere you know, had learned how to direct Chekhov and Shakespeare, but also they have this weird idea where it's like a headphone play and you walk down the street with it and like, what is that about? And so it's kind of like, how do we provide a home for like the island of misfit toys that like exist in like the current culture of like, I have this like crazy idea that's a man on a bicycle and you follow him around, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so POP is a, ser a series of like theater experiences that are happening in public places in venues, most of those venues are bars, um, in basements, there's like a wacky basement theater I've come across on accident, and it takes place, the best way I've kind of learned to describe it is a theatrical pub crawl, kind of, um, where the audience has a map and they can kind of go around to whatever place they wanna go to and see different things, or they get tapped on a shoulder and they go to a secret place, or they're walking down the street because they live there and they happen to like get asked to go into a U-Haul truck and there's a drag queen and there's a dance party. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of twofold of like the people that are in the know kind of can go around and go see all these different experiences and be a part of that and like be really close to it. And also there's maybe somebody that was just trying to go get a cup of coffee and the next thing they know they're, you know, in some basement watching a 20 minute piece of theater that's a movement piece about what it means to be a black man in America, you know, and so, that's kind of like a very um, like sampling platter of what pop is. Um, I'm happy to even like talk further about it, but I know that's kind of like the introduction to the idea. Perfect, thank you. Um, Sarah, I don't know if you were in the networking session this morning, but there was a dialogue that came up about finding mentors and, and a young Turk spoke, I thought very intelligently about saying, not all 
every mentor has to be a theater person. And in point of fact, the example that was used was, I love science, you know, maybe it, I should make a relationship with a doctor. Um, and I, of course, instantly thought of you. So can we maneuver for you to talk a little bit about what you're doing? Sure, thank you. Uh, just to start off by saying thank you to LMDA and to, and to Mark Bly, because really without this grant, the things I'm gonna describe to you that I've been doing, I would not be doing. It would not be possible for me to be in the room. So it's, it's, uh, it's been a massive opportunity. Uh, so just a little bit of uh, context about the project. It's called the High z Project, and it's a project to create an immersive installation based on the 2011 Nobel Prize winning discovery of the accelerating expansion of the universe. So in the late 90s, there was this race among astrophysicists to find the rate at which the expansion of the universe was decelerating. And what they actually discovered was that the, the expansion is accelerating. And um, in, a, in a very simplified, uh, in a, uh, to, to simplify what they were doing, they were, they were observing really distant supernovae, which are um, stellar explosions and finding that they were fainter than they, than they thought they should be, uh, and that is because uh, they were further away. Um, so the, th this project is occurring because it's being led by this incredible team, sister team, so this, this comes back to your, your question, Beth, um, and they are uh, Naima Crystal Phillips, who is an interdisciplinary artist and a playwright, and her sister, Lara Ariel Phillips, who is an astrophysicist. She, uh, um, Ariel is also married to a scientist named Peter Garnovich, who is on that uh, team that made the discovery. And so together, um, Ariel and Naima came up with this idea to explore the discovery in terms of not only the science, but also what it means in human terms to make a discovery like this. So the, the output of the project will be an installation in a planetarium type space, and it will be a real combination of um, uh, digital projection, but also very tangible elements that you can explore that will express uh, anything f like the workstations that you, uh, that you might sit at during a period of observation and you'll be able to explore what those stations uh, might have looked like and felt like in the 90s when the discovery was being made. Um, I think, oh, I'll just let you know who else is on the team because that's also extremely important. There's five of us in total. I've talked about Naima and Ariel. Also on the team is Keith Davis, who's also an astrophysicist. He and Ariel are both based at the University of Notre Dame, which has been a massive supporter of this project. Uh, Naima and myself are both based in Montreal, where we're supported by Playwrights Workshop Montreal, which is a nationally Canadian, nationally mandated um, play development and creation center. Um, and Yale Prezant, who is a dramaturg, um, who used to be at the University of Notre Dame and is now based in Italy, which was a move that happened after she was working on the project. So not unlike the scientists who were based all over the world collaboratively while they were making the, this discovery, we are also uh, mainly in, in, in three uh, international locations. Um, Keith also at the, at the university runs the DVT, which is the Digital Visualization Center, which is a kind of planetarium. So together we are all have embarked on creating this installation and we are in what we're calling phase two of the project, uh, which is really the creation of the blueprint, the narrative, the, 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 the story and um, uh, some of those pieces are, uh, Keith has been working on creating uh, digital animations of, of in, in particular, the, all the supernovae discovered in the last two to 300 years. Um, Naima and Ariel have been all over the world interviewing uh, almost all 20 of the scientists on the team to date. Um, uh, about everything from the discovery to their childhoods, what inspired them to become scientists in the first place, which is uh, f figuring out that, that intersection between the science and the imagination is one of the big th themes that we're exploring. 
Uh, Naima and I, we also have access to about 3,000 emails that pass between members of the team during the course of the seven years of the discovery, which we've been using as text and mining for story elements and um, rituals that go into the process of observation. Um, so the two, the two parts of this project that have been made possible by LMDA are uh, um, in June, Naima and I were able to go on a professional observation run to the Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope, which is just outside of Tucson. I say just outside, but it's actually at 10,000 feet. And <laughs> I really got a sense of, uh, of, of, what it is, of what it is like to go on that process, uh, to stay up all night, the, how mundane it is, and also how exhilarating it is when things line up and you might have found a, a piece of science that goes into uh, w one step closer to proving uh, this, this uh, y your theory or your, your unknowable outcome of, of the, the road that you've sort of set yourself out on. And it was an incredible experience and we really feel that actually part of our job in the installation is to be able to convey to our audience uh, something of, of, of what the experience of observing is like. At least that's the, that was the entry point for me in terms of the thing that I was most curious about and most excited about that would give me access to uh, scientific understanding that, that I don't actually have access to. I, I, in this case, I really am the most ignorant person in the room and it's, if, if you were looking for a consultant on this subject to create this, I would be at, at, at the bottom of that list, I think. It's really about, it's, uh, the dramaturgical work here is really about, is about the storytelling and actually in a lot of ways, it's an asset to have nothing but questions. Um, and then the second thing that the, this grant is enabling us to do is to meet in residency for the first time, all five of us in the same room in the Digital Visualization Center at the University of Notre Dame. So that's gonna happen in August. We'll actually be able to get in the room, finally hash out the blueprint, experiment, actually be under the dome, see some of the things that, that have been created and to uh, start setting up pieces of the installation so we can start figuring out how they work and continuing to design that, that audience experience. That's great, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, so Sally, I kind of saved you for last because in, in a really delightful way, you combine a lot of the, the kind of story points that we're unpacking here, both in that you're dealing with a non-traditional form, um, but you're also dealing with international points of connection in the really old fashioned way. You're getting on an airplane and traveling to them. Uh, so tell us a little bit about what it is that you're doing. Uh, great, so first of all, hello. Thank you. Uh, so I work in cabaret, and it is very difficult to talk about cabaret at 3 p.m. in the afternoon when you're all sober. So <laughs> would you please, for a moment, uh, you're all dramaturgs, so I know you have powerful imaginations. If we can just move the clock forward to about 11 p.m., if you can imagine that you have a drink in your hand or a vice of your choice alongside you, like, act, no, I'm actually being serious. Please do this. Uh, for those of you who are underage, that's it. Thank you. For those of you who are underage, please imagine you have an imaginary fake ID. <laughs> Thank you. And then don't tell me about it, because I don't want to know. And also don't tell me. Uh, can we also take our imaginary drinks for a minute, uh, if you wouldn't mind indulging me in this, to raise a glass and thank the Bly Committee and LMDA. For providing um, these amazing, I mean, it's been amazing to hear about everything else that's happening. Um, and it's certainly been really powerful uh, for me to have this opportunity um, because uh, cabaret is an art form that is often, um, uh, we call it an underground art form. It's uh, a little bit um, about being in the know is how you find it because you've heard about it. Uh, or you know someone who's like, let's go see this weird thing. And that way I think it's sort of a lot like what Kelly is talking about. People tend to stumble into it. Uh, which is how I found Cabaret as well. Um, I am the Associate Artistic Director uh, and Resident Dramaturg for a Philadelphia-based company called The Bearded Ladies Cabaret. 
Anyone here know us? Thank you, Philadelphia. Excellent. Um, and uh, I met them about four years ago. Uh, they had been working in cabaret, um, and we call ourselves a queer experimental cabaret company. And those are terms that we interrogate constantly. So if you want to know what they mean, come find me later, and I'll tell you what they mean at 11 PM, uh, what they mean to me today. Um, and, uh, but what I want to focus on, I think, is sort of interrogating the idea of what cabaret is. Uh, because when we started, and when I first met this company, um, I didn't know very much, and they were learning by doing. Uh, and so we, we stumbled together into this forum and started defining it for ourselves, using our base knowledge of what we thought the forum was about, um, and the mentorship of some uh, Philadelphians. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Martha Graham Cracker. Yay. <laughs> Yes, and if you've never seen Martha Graham Cracker, she's at Joe's Pub a lot, and I highly recommend checking her out. Um, uh, she's the alter ego of Dito Van Rygersburg, for folks who know Dito. Um, so through mentorship of people like Dito, we started to figure out for ourselves, but we also learned that that process was very difficult um, because I think we've talked a lot about uh, how theater communities can feel very isolated, and it is even more isolating, I think, for cabaret artists because they're in this underground form um, that is so much about being in the know um, to find them. And so uh, embedding in a community, we can find out slowly who our fellow cabaret artists are in the city. But if I transplant to Portland, um, it is very different, difficult for me to locate people like Carla Rossi, for those who heard Anthony speak yesterday. Um, and most importantly, while there has been a lot of scholarship on historical cabaret, and not even a lot actually, I'm gonna say there's been some scholarship on historical cabaret, um, focusing on uh, turn of the century France and Weimar Germany. There's not been a lot of writing on cabaret in contemporary performance by practitioners. Um, and in fact, a lot of those practitioners don't even know that others like them exist. Uh, outside of New York City, I would say is the exception. Um, and so what I, my company, and my research partner, John Jarbo, who's the artistic director of the Bearded Ladies, are trying to do is we're trying to create a digital space um, for people to find each other. And then we're gonna try to turn that digital space into an immersive performance. Um, and so what that involves uh, for us first is doing extensive research um, by actually going to these cities, uh, cities and trying to meet artists we're interested locally, so if any of you have cabaret connections, um, I would love to talk to you in your own cities. Um, but we are also interested in reaching back to the ancestors of our form, uh, which means going to Paris and going to Berlin and figuring out not only what the history there is, but also how that history has led to the contemporary performance in those places. Um, and then, hopefully, sharing that information with the practitioners that we've discovered and also hopefully the larger theater community um, so that we can become a voice to talk about what is truly exciting about this forum that is really having a moment right now, I think, and has been for about the past five to 10 years in America. Um, and what we can share from what we've learned as cabaret artists with the larger theater community. So that's part one of my project. Um, and that's the part that I'm embedded in right now, I'd say, is doing that kind of research. Um, the second part is that um, I am a cabaret dramaturg, and I have been investigating for the past year or so, I'd say I've been in this free fall questioning of what that means. <laughs> um, because so much about being a cabaret artist is a lot about performer, being a performer. Um, and I do not perform. How many of you started as actors? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I knew there'd be a lot of you, but that is a way, that's a much higher percentage than I was expecting. Um, I did not. Uh, I have never wanted to be a performer, um, which is not a knock against performers. I think they're amazing. It's just not part of my DNA. Um, and yet I've become aware in the past year and a half of how much performance goes into my role as a dramaturg how often I am performing dramaturgy. Um, I know that it's pop, I know I do this and I would imagine some of you do as well, uh, to use metaphors to explain like what you do. Anyone wanna shout out some of their favorites? Uh, favorite metaphor, so I might say like, I'm somebody's, sometimes I'm a personal Wikipedia. Consultant, great. 
Midwife, that's one of my favorites. Sherpa, Sherpa. I've never. Right hand man, what was that? Hand holder. Hand holder. Play, whisperer. Play whisperer, I love all of these. Lady <laughs> Great. <laughs> so um, I think we could, obviously we could keep going and I wanna hear the more, as we get more drunk on our fake <laughs> drinks, I wanna hear more. Um, Anyway, but I, and I think that depending on the project, we're all, we all know that different things are demanded of us at different times, depending on who we're working with, how we're working, which contract we're using. Um, and, and so I became aware of, of how that started to impact my presence in the room, how I was entering rooms, how I was behaving within those rooms. Um, I wear a lot of different hats as a freelance artist, um, and even the different personas that I take on with different companies that I'm in. Um, and so I started deconstructing my performance as a cabaret dramaturg, and then I read the call for fly applications, and then I wrote this grant. Um, and so in addition to exploring the research part of cabaret, I am using the vocabulary of cabaret to explore myself as a dramaturg, what it means to be a non-performing cabaret artist, what it means to be a cabaret dramaturg, what it means for me to be a dramaturg in this moment. And um, in December, I'm gonna uh, embark on a two-week workshop that uses some of the techniques that I've discovered in this cabaret research um, to explore performative dramaturgy. Um, and the, I, I'm still not really sure, I have to be honest, I'm not really sure what I mean by performative dramaturgy. That's what the workshop is for. <laughs> And that's um, what some of the funding is helping me uh, figure out. And what I have determined is that I can't do it by myself. Um, and so there's, uh, we're gonna do a two week workshop where I invite a number of different kinds of artists um, to spend some time with me exploring that question uh, from my fellow company members who are performers and designers uh, to um, uh, playwrights to uh, voice people um, to choreographers, to costume designers, um, and uh, also I'm gonna spend some time with some dramaturgs in a room <laughs> thinking about what that means and asking them to perform performance dramaturgy. How these two things will eventually hopefully resolve and fit together is that, um, uh, so we're doing this project that we call the Poison Cookie Project, um, which comes from, I'm reaching down to get this quote, uh, comes from this beautiful quote by a Weimar era uh, cabaret composer named Friedrich Hollander, um, who wrote in an article that uh, cabaret, like nothing else, suddenly dispenses a poison cookie. Suggestively administered and hastily swallowed, its effect reaches far beyond the harmless evening to make otherwise placid blood boil and inspire a sluggish brain to think. Um, so I'm just gonna let that quote sit because it's amazing. Um, and so one thing that we're, we're trying to do when we gather these different uh, cabaret artists that hopefully we'll be meeting uh, is we're hoping to bring them to Philadelphia to work on an immersive performance together in which they um, perform their current existing cabaret work but are also invited to perform historical cabaret works um, or pieces that are inspired by historical cabaret work. Um, so perhaps somebody like just an example, because if we could get this person, that would be amazing. Uh, so somebody like Taylor Mac uh, performing uh, Weimar Berlin, for example, in addition to performing Taylor's own, a piece of Taylor's own. Um, and part of that process will incorporate performative dramaturgy in some way um, to help audience navigate the historical research and the contemporary performance. So I hope that wasn't too confusing. <laughs> but that's No, that was great. Thank you, Sally. Um, Thank you. So Mr. Bly, two years ago when you and Cindy Sorrell hatched this project, and I'm sure a dark and smoky bar somewhere, um, or maybe not so smoky, uh, one of the phrases that the two of you lit on that we've shared with the membership a lot is that you wanted to breathe fresh air into dramaturgy. And one of the things that excites me, having been on the selection committee, um, is that every single project we've heard about is about different forms of what it is to make theater. It's about different forms of what it is to be a dramaturg. 
Um, it's it frequently reaching audience members in non-traditional places. And so I'm just wondering, you know, having kind of had a couple months to sit with some of these projects and now to have met everybody and, and to have heard them talk, what's rumbling through your head? Well, there's one of the things that excites me about this um, uh, is that there's there's something about the the physics of dramaturgy that somehow is is rumbling through this. Uh, a couple of them are obvious, I suppose. Uh, that somehow, I mean, we, we started off with, with one group that literally has decided to transgress the boundaries of time and space. <laughs> and I love that. <laughs> it just said, the hell with it. We're, we're going to use some mechanisms to transgress the boundaries of time and space, and dramaturgy is going to lead the way. Well, that's exactly the point of, of what I wanted. And early on, when I, I assembled a group of people uh, old friends, uh, in many cases, but more than friends, people I would trust my life with. You know, beyond volunteers, these are people I'd trust my life with. In the case of Liz Engelman, I did as we drove through the mountains of Mexico through a rainstorm once. Uh, it was worse than Romancing the Stone, if you've ever seen that <laughs> film. Uh, but, but seriously, I mean, that's exactly what I meant when people said, well, aren't you going to give examples? And with great love for these people, I said, no. That will limit what people will come up with. And there's, this is a perfect example of it. This is a perfect example of it. I did not want cookie cutter ideas. These are not cookie cutter ideas. And I, 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 I'm, I just am thrilled by this. As I was thrilled with the first year group, and perhaps later on, if people have questions about What's happened to that first year group? We can, uh, some of the liaisons who are in the off, uh, audience here can talk about that, like Jeff Prohl. Uh, two of those four have resulted in books. Not bad. Uh, not bad. Uh, but back to this notion of, of the, the physics of it. I mean, this is really exciting for me, uh, uh, that this has is, this is helped to, to uh, generate some things. and. Uh, Back to that notion, uh, I, I, this is thrilling here, but at the same time, uh, this morning, I don't want to sound like, I forget who it is, in, in, through the looking glass, some character says, everybody's a winner, everybody gets prizes. Uh, Nora uh, uh, Elgis was talking uh, from the point of view of the Umbrella Project, and she said, and I, was, I was really, to say I was touched was uh, beyond a statement. Uh, she said that she had applied for this and she, she didn't get it, but it didn't matter. She somehow, in, in filling out the application, realized this is what she wanted to do anyway. And she went forward with it. And, and somehow I realized, sitting there this morning, uh, I sat there and I went, yeah, that was exactly in a way it was part of a conversation that early on Cindy Sorrell and I had had. Actually, I wish it had been in the smoky bar. It was long distance phone calls. Uh, I realized early on that was part of our conversations where I had said something like, yes, I, we were using phrases like breaking boundaries, all of these phrases, which have meaning. Of course they have meaning. But we always think about those in terms of the outward boundaries, you know, pioneering boundaries, all of those things. And I realized that Nora was speaking about something else, which is actually just as important, that we all have these interior boundaries that we have to break too. And Nora, as a mature artist, broke an interior boundary that was equally important than getting some award, some check. And she said, nevertheless, I'm going to still achieve something. And for those who in the audience didn't get a check, you know, you can, you can achieve something too. You know, and I think that's the big lesson. And I just want to make sure in the midst of a celebration in quotation marks that you take that away today. I think it's really, really important uh, 
it's so important to remember that. I just want everybody, not to diminish, <laughs> everybody smiles up here. <laughs> But, but I think it's so important to remember there are boundaries out there and there are boundaries in here that we all have to break. It's really important. Um, does that answer your question? I did have some other things I wanted to share, though, as well. Uh, and this sort of goes with the future. Can I move into that? Uh, so that we can also have plenty of time to go back there. Um, and also have you guys have questions. Uh, we were talking a little bit about the past. We're in the present, but there's a big future coming up. We've got some surprises. Uh, I need to share some things. Um, how to say this, how to say this. Uh, well, I'll, I'll go back to physics. Uh, uh, a lot of times with my playwriting students, but with playwrights that I work with, uh, who will always come to me and say, oh, Somebody is asking me what the play is about. Someone is asking me what the scene is about. An actor is asking me, whatever. And I'll say, you know, you're, you're, you're in the midst of the act of creation. And I'll, I'll, I'll share with them a, a cosmological metaphor, a cosmological paradigm. And that is, uh, You'll appreciate this, Sarah. Uh, that at least today, at this point in time, God knows in 10 years, the idea will change uh, as science advances or moves forward. There's the belief uh, from the moment of Big Bang, the Big Bang theory, that within a factor of a few nano, 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 nano seconds of time, moments of time, that as matter expanded, or what we would call particle matter expanded, whatever you want to call that, outward, that matter, or the creative matter, actually expanded faster than light. And I always say to the playwright, you know, sometimes it's more important that that matter, and the density of that matter expands faster than the illumination. So don't worry about explaining the illumination or the light on that matter. It's taken us two years to get to this point, <laughs> and it took us a while, there were seven of us, to create this Bly Creative Capacity Grant. And, and it was hard, as Beth can tell you. We didn't have a, a plan that was instantaneous. It was not fully formed. There was a lot of struggles. Uh, and uh, the seven people that helped me put it together, oh my God, the long hours that they worked were endless. Uh, Jeff Prohl, Cindy Sorrell, Vicki Stroish, Beth Blickers, uh, Brian Quirt, uh, Liz Engelman, Cindy Sorrell, and myself. That's seven? Uh, to say that they worked a couple hundred hours is an underestimation. No people who worked on a, a committee have ever worked so hard as those people. And I just want to take a moment. Can we give that group of people applause? <laughs> No NEA committee ever worked so hard, and I've been on plenty of them. Uh, I'm bringing that up because at this moment in time, and I've, I've met with all these people, I've talked uh, with Ken, our incoming president. You'll always be a president, you'll always please. Uh, 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 I've shared all of this information with Ken. Ken and I have had several meetings. We've had wonderful meetings talking about all of this. Uh, Jeff, Cindy, Vicki, and Beth are formally rotating off the Bly Creative Capacity Grant uh, so that they don't die an early death, if nothing else. Uh, coming on, uh, Brian, I, Liz Engelman, are staying on. Ken is coming on, of course, as the new president. 
I'm bringing on two new people. Perhaps you know them. Uh, Yvette Nolan. Yes? Extraordinary person. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I had the extraordinary privilege of being part of uh, the Howl Round uh, um, interview a conversation that we had. Uh, I, I, my remembrance of that was one of the most special remembrances to the point that I don't even remember the audience. I just remember sitting with her and having a conversation. It was so special. And uh, also, uh, an extraordinarily gifted playwright, uh, dramaturg, uh, TCG blogger, artist, uh, uh, Jacqueline Lawton. I don't know if you know her or not. She, too, is also going to be coming on the, the committee. So we're adding two more people uh, as well to that group, selection committee, starting for the, in effect, the third application group. Uh, now, having said that, hold that in your brain, because we're now going to shift gears into uh, warp nine. Ken has kept this all in his brain. He's been amazing. You're going to love him as a president. He's kept this all in his brain. Um, I don't believe in discarding people. Uh, I still don't believe in that. And a couple months ago, I was sitting in uh, Beth's office, and we were having a great conversation, and, and I just said, so, I've got some ideas. Uh, Four years for this Bly Creative Capacity Grant is not enough. I think we need to do a year five and six. And we talked about the idea of Beth. Uh, I have a lot of friends, a, a lot of former students of mine who've gone on to do exceedingly well in television, who have promised uh, they will do anything for me. <laughs> and they can. Uh, and what I've asked Beth to do, uh, as part of her rotating off and, and, and having a, a, you know, all presidents have some task as they leave. Well, she really does. Uh, I'm putting together a list of about X number of people, former playwriting students of mine at Yale, uh, and other friends, people who taught for me at Yale for many years, uh, who've also done exceedingly well, that she's going to become, and here's a new title, Bly Creative Capacity Grant Ambassador at Large in Fundraising. <laughs> Again, I shared this with Ken, and we've had great conversations about this. And uh, so she is going to be doing that. She, because she is nationally, internationally known even, uh, among all of these playwrights and uh, the agents, is quite capable of being the pitch person to these agents and to these playwrights for me, representing me, so that I don't have to go and do that. Uh, and they are targeted to go forth and raise more money in the name of the Bly Creative Capacity Grant for years five and six. So that's part one of this. So we're not discarding this person. She's too valuable. Part two, uh, Cindy Sorrell, uh, again, so invaluable about the work that she did in helping to create this. We created another position called the Bly Creative Capacity Grant uh, Ambassador at Large in Publishing. And having uh, discussions, uh, and again, in, in deciding this, I want to make sure you also know that Brian and Liz had a great deal of input in this. Uh, I also shared with Ken and Brian and Liz the notion of, I want another position, Bly Creative Capacity Grant Ambassador at Large in Publishing. And again, Cindy, because of all the work she's done, uh, I said, I think, and, and I, Ken and I had some really great discussions about this, uh, transparency issues. This harkens back to my metaphor that I started with about the, about the playwright, that sometimes matter is created and the matter expands faster than the illumination. 
the transparency, if you will, the light. Maybe this has moved too fast. Not everybody knows about everything we're doing. Well, now you will. Cindy is going to create a Bly Creative Capacity Grant guidebook, an A through Z of it, that will be online for everybody to know the A through Z of how we've created this, the application, everything, the history of it. And it's going to be online for you and also for funders so that this will be there. She's also going to be in charge of a Creative Capacity Grant in effect, chronicle a history of this. So all of this stuff is going to be chronicled. So we're not going to lose the history of this. And she's going to be tapping individual people, young and old members, to do articles, interviews that will be in the LMDA Review, newsletters, and outside publications. It's about goddamn time. American Theater, Theater Forum, and maybe funding type publications as well. So the message gets out about this. This is not just about fucking me. This is about LMDA and the kind of work that's being done. The kind of work that's being done. That's the point. It's always been the point. It's always been the point. Oxygen, it's always been the point. That's always been the point. Um, I, think, I think that was all I had to say. It was too damn much anyway, but. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. <laughs> so we just have time for a couple of questions from the audience. If you have anything that you want to ask Kelly or Sally or Sarah, or thoughts you want to share in terms of non-traditional art forms, non-traditional dramaturgical forms. Uh, you know, we invite stories from your own life adventures. As Mark said, if, if people who are here, who are the spokespeople to the first year recipients, want to throw in an update from, from the group they're reporting to, uh, we would be, be delighted to hear from all of you. So we've got some volunteers running around with mics. Anyone want to throw their hand in the air? Raise hands high, please. Hey, thanks. Um, I'm really excited about all the projects hearing about. Um, I'm curious with POP because I think I might be in New York, so I'd love Shut to hear up. the dates again. And I'm also curious about how you're um, ticketing it, and since people can encounter it by chance, yes. um, how those logistics are working for that style of festival. Totally. Um, the, yeah, the dates are September 23rd to the 25th, um, and it's free, so you can happen upon it if you're there, except for one, which is... I really hope it works out. I really hope it's gonna happen. It's a puppet dinner party, so you get um, food and drink. So because of that, we're gonna charge tickets because it's like a restaurant. You know, you get you get some stuff with it, and it's a capacity issue. So, but otherwise, it's um. Also, I'll give you one of these. I brought a lot of them. This is like how I'm kind of like getting the word out. This is um. It's a zine I made, um, and it's kind of been like the best way I've learned to like tell people about it because I'm like hitting up bartenders and they're like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, here, read this. So this kind of um, is how I've been kind of getting the word out. It's like, here's the dates, here's some like extra details, here's some like big picture stuff and here's like the website you can check out. And then eventually this kind of idea is going to become the map that then will list where all the things are. Um, and this kind of came out of um, I didn't want to spend any of the Bly money on just like a glossy postcard because I'd rather buy something weird like a weather balloon or something. I'm just like, no. So, <laughs> um, so I just like went to the Yale School of Drama in the night and like used their color copier um, for free. So yeah, so <laughs> anyway, but yeah, so I've made a bunch of these while watching Orange is the New Black. So I'm happy to like disperse them around as well. But if you yeah. can't see them because you're way over there, they're gorgeous and you definitely want one. <laughs> This on. Hi, Sarah. Um, it sounds like a fascinating project. I'm just really interested in what narratives have come out and how you are working with science and the science is working with you, really. Oh. Great question. Um, 
I think w one of the things that I've really been wrestling with is uh, what what is the meeting point between the the, sci the science and the imagination. Uh, so how um, how do we um, how how do we if w because because the science might see if you if you're not familiar with the science it might not necessarily seem to affect your everyday life although it affects has affected everything that we have believed to be true about the universe um, how how do we express the significance of the discovery in, in, in those terms? And, and so one of the things that we've really been thinking about and talking about is actually how, how the science affects the imagination or what is the connection of the elements of the, the night sky that we become familiar with and sing about as children, how does that connect to the science, which connects up to the stories of how the scientists became scientists or astrophysicists in the first place and actually what they tell their children and what their relationship is with the sky and the imagination as well as with the science. So f figuring out um, how that might be translated is, is something I've been thinking about a lot. Well, I'm just wondering if I need to be worried that the universe is expanding. <laughs> Only in good ways dramaturgically. Okay, great. And the, and they just, are expanding the universe. Okay. So can we say congratulations and thank you. And we look forward to hearing from them in the coming years as these projects come to fruition. Um, I'm going to end this section a little early because I don't know that every single person who's going to want to check it out backstage is going to be able to fit there in one round. So we may have to cycle through in a couple of groups. So the AGM starts at 4.15, Coriana. Um, I believe that's accurate. I'd love for you all to be here. So go ahead and go backstage right. Oh, actually, there's going to be volunteers out in the hallway. So go out this door. Find the volunteers. They will lead you to the green room. Go have your mind blown on the holodeck. And then come on back and hear from your board and exec. Thanks, all. <laughs>